Good evening, Tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope everyone is well, and I hope that everyone has had a good week, wherever you are, and that 2021 is going as well for you so far as it can. Before we begin, I'd like to give my usual thanks to Andrew McLean for making all the art that is featured in this episode and since the reclamation. I'd also like to thank my patrons as well, because your pledges to me every week really are appreciated, and I cannot understate that enough. I would also like to mention the Hunger Games Discord that was featured a few weeks ago. The link is still available in the description. And there is also another Discord that has been created by a channel named It's Robo, or It's Robo, apologies for whichever one I'm mispronouncing. And I'm also going to feature that in the description, and that is a Discord that is based solely on this series, which is something I'm rather excited about, so feel free to check that out. So, enough chit-chat, without further ado, let's go. The first two reapings that were conducted by Sheaf Jaborski were rather bland affairs, mainly due to Sheaf's less exciting presentational skills, which bored capital viewers. By the time he arrived in District 10, viewers were hoping for a much more interesting display. The tour of the district was rather awkward, most likely due to Sheaf having been responsible for the deaths of both of this district's tributes in the previous year's games. Eventually, after returning to the Reaping Square, the Reaping itself took place. After mumbling a few words of encouragement, Sheaf picked a name from the female bowl and announced it to be 16-year-old Devon Jimenez. The camera quickly found a dark-skinned young lady in pathetic orange rags who looked as desperate as she was shocked, and while she walked to the platform, the heat could be seen to glisten through her short beige frizz of hair. Devon came from an isolated farm in the southern desert of the district, where she mainly worked as a cow breeder. A brief handshake ensued between Devon and Sheaf before a male name was chosen. Sheaf squinted slightly at the name, before revealing it to be 18-year-old Barzona Stax. An empty space soon formed around a tall and muscular young man at the back of the enclosure. He breathed out in what appeared to be anger, before marching through the enclosure and down the aisle. It took a while to notice that he had short black hair, but this was hardly noticeable above his muscular frame. Barzona was well known around the centre of the district, where he worked in his parents' tavern that was a popular hub of social activity amongst the locals. Whilst barely saying a word, Barzona shook hands with Sheaf and then Devon, before being escorted into the town hall. As Sheaf began the train journey for his home district, Barzona was visited by his parents and younger sister. Whilst his mother and sister cried, his father encouraged him to do whatever he could to survive, and he tried to sneak Barzona a flask of whiskey, but this was quickly confiscated by peacekeepers, and the family were ejected. As for Devon, she was visited by some of the other orphans who lived on her farm. None of them really had any strong advice to give her, and so Devon spent most of this time giving them information about her cows in terms of diets, ovulation patterns, and even sleeping arrangements. One of the present peacekeepers said that this was one of the most surreal parting meetings that he had ever encountered, but once a few minutes had gone by, Devon's visitors were dismissed, and she and Barzona were escorted down to the station. After being placed in the carriage together, Devon introduced herself properly to Barzona, and she attempted to get to know him better, but he hardly replied to her, and according to the AVOX present, she seemed to become exasperated rather quickly with a lack of conversation from Barzona, who was hardly moving any part of his body or even face. The food was subsequently wheeled into the carriage by a group of AVOXes, and as soon as they had left, Devon quickly made her way over to the food and seemed speechless in wonder at the sheer quantity of what was on offer. The AVOX present reported that Devon subsequently grabbed a plate, but unlike most tributes during their meal on the train, she became very selective about what she was grabbing to eat, and avoided the roast turkey that stood at pride of place in the centre of the table, instead opting for the steamed vegetables and fruit that were available, before taking her plate back to the dining table, opposite where Barzona was sitting. He watched as she started to eat, before asking her why she had not taken any of the turkey, which was in fact the first question that he asked her over that day. Devon looked up in surprise, but stated that she did not eat meat, which allegedly even made the AVOX look at her in surprise. Barzona asked what she meant by this, and Devon simply repeated that she did not like to eat animals, which appeared to confuse him even further. He then asked why this was the case when she worked with animals, to which Devon fired back that she worked to produce them, not to kill them, before tucking into a glazed mango. After appearing to process what he had just heard, Barzona subsequently got up and walked to the food table, but he only chose to take very small portions, barely filling half of his plate. When Barzona sat down with Devon, 
She asked him why he had taken so little food, to which he replied that he wanted to become accustomed to eating less food, but Devon once again fired back that surely they should use the opportunity to eat as much as possible whilst they could. Just as Barzona looked ready to reply, an old lady's voice was heard from the doorway of the carriage, stating that there were merits to both approaches. Devon and Barzona both jolted around to see their mentor, Michele Onassis, stood in the doorway. As the pair looked at each other in the realisation that this was their mentor, she commented that a more important question was how they had not noticed her standing there for the last minute, and that if one of their fellow tributes had heard this conversation, they would know pretty much everything they needed to know about both Devon and Barzona. She then stated that you never know who's listening. Over the next few hours, the three of them ate some more food, and Michelle spoke to her tributes about what would happen over the next week, and she seemed to get to know their different approaches as to what they would do once they were in the arena. Yet once the late evening had arrived, Barzona, who once again went back to near silence, stated that he was feeling tired and overwhelmed by all this information, and that he wanted to sleep before returning to his carriage. Michelle then spent time speaking to Devon about what her best chances were to win the games, and what route she should take over the next week. Later in their discussion, Michelle asked Devon how she would survive in an arena where the only available food was meat from animals, and to Michelle's surprise, Devon stated that she would go without, as an animal should not have to die for her to live. Michelle then looked at her with a quizzically amused look, before stating that she might change her mind about this later, then telling her that she should get some rest in her carriage. The next morning, the train from District 10 arrived in Snow Station shortly after the tributes from District 11 had made their way to the accommodation quarters. Upon leaving the train, both Barzona and Devon were immediately accosted by capital citizens who wanted pictures with them, and they both seemed rather out of place amongst the bright clothing and loud natures of these citizens. Michelle chose to round up the platform greetings after just a few minutes, and as various members of the crowd protested, Michelle grabbed her tributes by the hand before walking off. It is alleged that she could be heard making rude comments about the capital under her breath, but this was never confirmed. Once they had made it into their apartment, Michelle immediately got down to work with a pair's stylist, Fulcra Breen. On multiple occasions, Fulcra had to prize Barzona away from many of the decorations and ornaments that he was trying to admire, until he lashed out at Fulcra in frustration, which caused Michelle to grab Barzona by the arm and hold him against the wall. She then proceeded to tell him that Fulcra and the other staff were trying to help him and Devon, and that he should be more grateful. Eventually, after jamming Barzona's arm even higher against his back, Michelle managed to extract an apology from him towards Fulcra and the fittings proceeded. During this time, Devon had been uncomfortably watching the ongoing conflict while she was being measured for horns that could be placed on her head. But supposedly in an effort to lighten the atmosphere, she asked Michelle if they could watch the television. Michelle agreed to this, and turn on Capital TV to show the reaping for District 4, where at that very moment, Sheaf Jaworski had his hand in the female reaping bowl. Sheaf announced that this year's female tribute for District 4 was 14-year-old Rhea Carter. This immediately caused concern chatter from the crowd, and a gasp from behind Sheaf, where the district's mayor had turned a deadly shade of pale. Eugenia Rabinstill then pointed out that Rhea must be Mayor Carter's daughter, and the camera proceeded to pan in on a pretty young lady in a light blue dress with flowing blonde hair, laced with light blue plaits that had clearly been designed to complement her dress. As she stood frozen to the spot, the girl next to Rhea tapped her on the shoulder, and the peacekeepers seemed to be debating whether they should enter the female enclosure in order to collect Rhea, who was still not moving. Eventually they did so, and they had to practically march her to the platform, as the tears began to fall down her cheeks, leaving tracks in her makeup. Once Rhea had made it to the platform and Sheaf offered his hand, she appeared to come to terms with what was happening, and she screamed before running over to her father. He sorrowfully looked away as she tried to grab onto his suit, and the peacekeepers on the platform grabbed Rhea, who was now screaming, before nodding to Sheaf, who began to pick out a male tribute amidst Rhea's persistent whimpers. A murmur was heard when Sheaf simply picked a piece of paper that was sticking out from the others on top, and was therefore the nearest to his hand. He opened it and called the name of 18-year-old Limerick Manx. The camera panned into the far back corner of the enclosure, where a tall, lean young man with a ragged charcoal ponytail was stood. Surprisingly, he grinned and let out a seemingly inevitable laugh, before shaking his head and marching past his peers towards the aisle. As Limerick made his way to the platform, the new training master, Enya Stolton, 
stated that this must be the most mismatched pair of tributes so far this year, before Eugenia stated that Limerick's shabby blue trousers looked like they were about to fall apart at any moment. Once on the platform, he quickly shook hands with Sheaf and then offered his hand to Rhea, but as he did so, she flinched, and it took her several seconds to gingerly grip onto the edge of his hand before letting it go. The newly reaped tributes were then taken into the town hall, where Rhea's mother shouted at her father for several minutes before being escorted from the town hall. After she had gone, Rhea's father told her to do everything she could to survive the bloodbath, and that he would then try to get as many sponsor gifts as he could to her. As for Limerick, his parents and four younger brothers were allowed in as two groups of three. Although most tributes are only allowed to have three visitors at most, Limerick allegedly knew the peacekeepers, and they were willing to look the other way for him. Once they had said their farewells, a tearful Limerick and a now hysterical Rhea were taken down to the train, where Rhea had to be practically thrown onto the train. The pair were then left in the carriage with only the Avox present, and Limerick tried to console Rhea, but she proceeded to push him away, before ripping out her plaits and sobbing by the window. Limerick then walked to the bar at the end of the carriage, before helping himself to a glass of whiskey. Just as Limerick imbibed, Rhea said to him that he should not be drinking alcohol. Limerick then grinned and looked at Rhea, before remarking that she should not be acting like a spoilt brat, just because she got picked like anyone else might. Rhea opened her mouth in shock, and Limerick raised his glass to her with a grin, before pouring the contents into his mouth. Rhea told Limerick to go to Scotland, before flouncing off the sofa and heading to the door, but just as she pulled it open, she stepped back at the sight of the pair's mentors, Annie Crester and Finnick Jr. O'Dare. As Annie marched into the carriage, Rhea seemed to involuntarily step back, in order to give her space, and Annie quickly surveyed the scene with a concerned expression. Finnick entered behind Annie and pointed at Limerick, before stating that this was be his last drink for now. Limerick looked at Finnick as if he were going to try and reason to his better nature, but Finnick marched over with a grin, saying that he would live in Scotland if he could, but that this was not the time or place for whiskey, which caused Limerick to chin the rest of the glass and walk out from behind the bar with his hands in the air, almost as if he were surrendering to Finnick. The men then introduced themselves, and Limerick began to ask Finnick about his games. Meanwhile, Annie tried to calm down Rhea, who was constantly swinging back and forth on her chair. As Rhea's panic and mumbling seemed to be mounting, Annie started to speak to her about the games, but Rhea proceeded to get up and shout that she did not want to go into the games, before storming out of the carriage and into the corridor. Annie looked in amazement at Finnick, who had been distracted by Rhea's outburst, and Limerick cut the silence by stating that he was not with her referring to Rhea. Finnick let out a slight chortle, and Annie rolled her eyes at him, before marching out of the carriage after Rhea. Limerick asked Finnick if he thought that Rhea had any chance of winning, to which he replied that he doubted it, but that this could be a convincing act, and that no tribute should ever underestimate another. Finnick then asked Limerick about his background, and he explained to Finnick that he, his father, and his brothers had been working as fishermen in and around Pearl Bay, which was known as one of the poorest areas of the district. It is known that Annie spent the rest of the afternoon with Rhea in her carriage, but it is unknown what they discussed exactly. Meanwhile, Finnick proceeded to test Limerick on his knowledge of poisonous fish, and he soon became impressed by Limerick's knowledge of toxicology. After a while, their discussion turned to more social issues, and Limerick asked Finnick what it was like to mentor with his mother, to which Finnick replied that even though she had always been extremely overprotective of him, there was nobody with whom he would rather perform the role. As it got dark, Annie eventually came back to the main carriage, stating that Rhea had finally worn herself out and was now sleeping. Annie herself seemed tired as well, and she told both Limerick and Finnick that they needed to go to bed soon, before going off to her own carriage. Limerick asked Finnick a little more about the upcoming week, and Finnick told him to focus mainly on the career tributes, whilst not letting them intimidate him. He also recommended not trying to partner with Rhea in any shape or form, as she would become a liability within the arena. Around midday, the train from District 4 arrived at Snow Station, and as usual, a large clamour of capital citizens flocked onto the platform in order to see Finnick Jr., with many young females desperately throwing themselves at him, even though his wife, Corell, was now pregnant with their daughter. Although Limerick appeared to have no trouble posing with capital citizens and making himself look desirable to Finnick's fans, Rhea was not so charismatic, and she seemed to spend as much time as possible hiding behind Annie. When the flash of one camera occurred near Rhea's face, she even jumped backwards in fright and fell against the train behind her, 
with Limerick allegedly joking to Finnick that she might have made an impression if the train had already left. The quartet then made their way to their apartment, and Annie and Finnick wasted no time in having their designer, Jogan Cardew, take their vital measurements and show them some of his designs. It was eventually decided that Limerick and Rhea would be dressed in light blue garments that would be draped in seaweed in order to best represent their district. That evening, the parade took place, with a record capacity of capital citizens cramming themselves into the avenue of the tributes. Although the sparkling scarlet outfits of Ravello and Velour, both from one, were well received, it was Antenno and Ursula, both from three, who were awarded with Anderson Fashion's Best Dressed, for their outfits made of flashing lights on deconstructed electrical wires. As the lights continued to flash, the audience's attention was constantly taken back to Antenno and Ursula, which helped them to steal the show from the other tributes. Whilst Limerick and Rhea's outfits were also well received by the capital, it was noted that there was clearly some tension between the two. Furthermore, Rhea was not waving, and seemed miserable compared to Limerick, who was a lot more enthusiastic. Shortly after the parade, Annie and Finnick agreed to separate the pair, who rather clearly disliked each other by this point. As for Barzona and Devon, both from Ten, their cow-themed couture received mixed reactions, with Eugenia stating that if they were going to dress as cows, they should take it all the way, and put on bells and hooves, whilst Ennius mentioned that they failed to make it funny for capital audiences, compared to previous bovine designs. After the parade, the tributes and their mentors returned to their apartments, and Finnick congratulated Limerick for making a good impression, whilst Annie tried to tell Rhea that she would only have received sponsor gifts if she made an effort to be likeable to capital citizens, but Rhea quickly responded that her father had contacts in the capital, who would make sure that she received what she needed. However, when Limerick asked Rhea how this strategy had worked for the drunk girl last year, Rhea stormed off to her bedroom, and as Annie followed after her, Limerick let out a slight grin and asked if it was something he said. Meanwhile, in the apartment for District 10, an argument erupted between Michelli and Barzona, with Barzona stating that their outfits were pure trash, whilst Michelli replied that they could have worn something less trashy if Barzona had cooperated with their stylists. Yet after peacekeepers were called in to sort out this conflict, it soon ended, and the tributes went to their rooms. To mark his first year as the training master, Ennius Dalton had ordered for more training stations to be added, as well as tasers to be given to training staff and himself, so that they could motivate any tributes who were not training adequately. It only took Ennius a few minutes to find and electrocute Rhea, who had hidden herself in one of the survival stations. Palmer from Seven then came over and stated that this was unfair, which caused Ennius to electrocute her as well. The other tributes appeared scared, and therefore quickly got back to their training, whilst Rhea limped off to the camouflage station before crying once more, and this appeared to annoy Utah from Six, who was intricately decorating his face. Meanwhile, Barzona attempted the hardest obstacle course, and eventually became the first tribute to complete it, with Tiberius from Two seeming extremely annoyed, as he had not yet managed to complete it himself. Limerick spent the second day in the fishing station, whilst Devon practised in the adjacent station for herbal toxicology. Limerick spent most of his time stabbing his spear into the water, in order to impale the fish that would dart beneath the surface. Occasionally this would cause a splash, but when Limerick became so annoyed with missing one of his targets that he threw the spear down into the water, a larger splash of water was formed and Devon's arm was dampened. She proceeded to ask Limerick to stop what he was doing, as this was stopping her from concentrating, to which he replied that she did not need to concentrate when she was playing with the plants. This appeared to anger Devon, who told Limerick that she could use one plant to feed herself and another to kill someone, before yelling that Limerick was a coward for killing defenceless fish. He laughed at what Devon said, before telling her to look around, and that she was deluded if she thought a few leaves could save her. At this point, Devon slammed down the plants that she had been holding, before marching angrily towards Limerick, who was now grinning at Devon's reaction. The training staff quickly came over and stood between the two, ready to use their tasers, but Ennius, who was watching from the mentoring gallery at this time, gave a signal for them to not use their tasers. Eventually, the argument was diffused, but not before Devon shouted at Limerick that she would win without being a murderer. Upon hearing this, Alba, from Two, looked extremely interested and whispered something to Tiberius, from Two, although it is unknown what she said. Ennius then came down to the floor as the argument was ending, before yelling at the tributes to get back to their training, and electrocuting Jesus from Twelve, who was the nearest tribute to him at the time. That evening, 
Both Finnick Jr. and Michelli had surprisingly similar conversations with Limerick and Devon respectively, in which they warned their mentees to stay away from their new adversaries and to not try to cause any more drama with other tributes, especially their district partners. The assessment and training scores occurred the next day, with a very mixed field of results. Limerick used some spears in order to target fish, before throwing them at targets, which scored him a respectable 8. Whilst it is unknown what Rhea did, but she ended up with only a 3, which tied her as the lowest scoring tribute, along with Motoro from 5, Branson from 9, and Life from 12. Barzona showed some skills with an array of weapons, which only scored him a 6, and placed him in the middle of this year's cohort, whilst Devon used a sword and demonstrated some knowledge of plants, which scored her a slightly better score of 7. The highest scores this year's belong to Ravello and Valor, both from 1, who each scored 11. The next evening, the interviews took place, and Eugenia entered the stage in a dress that looked like it had been created by fusing an array of icicles together. As the applause finally died down and she was about to begin the proceedings, she called for her butler, and an Avox came out with a bottle of wine, identical to the bottle sent to Panatella Skillane in last year's games along with a pre-poured glass on a tray. This quip garnered laughter from the audience, and as Eugenia was about to drink from the glass, she casually stated that she found this half-used bottle in the arena, which mustered even more controversial laughter from the crowd. The interviews then got underway, with each of the career tributes making strong impressions, whilst making mild digs at each other. Ursula from 3 also impressed the audience with her vast knowledge of electrics, and how they had been used advantageously for past tributes. Rhea's interview was rather pitiful, and although she did not cry like Annie had allegedly feared, she still seemed unwilling to be interviewed, and it was only when Eugenia complimented her on her dress that a slight smile was gained from Rhea. On the other hand, Limerick was much better received by the capital. He shared a decent level of banter with Eugenia, and as the interview went on, they appeared to almost be daring each other to be more and more flirtatious, which the audience seemed to find extremely amusing. Towards the end of the interview, Limerick was asked if he had any conflict already with any other tributes, and he grinned as he mentioned that his district partner was a moany brat, and that there was a plant freak from another district that had annoyed him, with both these comments causing controversial laughter from the audience. In the following interviews, Utah from Six appeared to be under the influence of Morphling, and although he was rather charming to Eugenia, he had to run off the stage towards the end of his interview, allegedly due to illness. On the other hand, Palmer from Seven appeared very unwilling to talk to Eugenia about anything related to the games, until she suddenly went on a monologue about how she wanted to plunge her axe into Ennius Dalton's face. Eugenia subsequently gave a rather bemused look to the audience, who were now jeering Palmer, and the camera cut to show Ennius in the audience, raising his glass in a mocking manner. As for Devon's interview, she used practically any opportunity she could in order to talk about how she planned to win without killing anyone or anything. This pacifist strategy seemed to perk the audience's interest, and although there was some disgust when Devon went into detail about how a cow could give birth, she still seemed to make a favourable impression on the capital. Yet Eugenia asked at the end of Devon's interview if she was the plant freak that another tribute had referred to during his interview, to which Devon replied that she was not bothered by what he thought. Barzona, on the other hand, was not the most charismatic of the tributes, but at the same time, he somehow managed to amuse the audience when he spoke about how much he disliked his outfit for the parade, and how he was more upset about having to dress like a cow than he was about going into the arena the next day. The final interview was with game maker Artulia Fling, and Eugenia began the conversation by congratulating Artulia on her engagement to Nebula Gaul, the sister of President Gaul, which had only been revealed the day before. Artulia graciously accepted the congratulations, and mentioned that they were looking forward to starting a family together over the next year. When pressed about the upcoming games, Artulia mentioned that the arena was extremely beautiful, and that this year's games would likely be very aesthetically pleasing, which gathered curious sounds and applause from the audience. The next day, all the tributes were led to their holding rooms, where they were ordered to dress in dark trousers and boots, along with jackets of their district colours. Annie briefly visited Rhea, who was now crying hopelessly. Annie proceeded to tell her that this was how she had felt before she went into her own games, and she had won, which seemed to motivate Rhea very slightly. Finnick told Limerick that he could win the games if he did not make any unwise decisions, or provocative comments towards dangerous tributes. Limerick grinned at what Finnick said, and the pair embraced, 
before Finnick got into his tube. As for the tributes from District 10, Michelle appeared to have completely given up with Barzona, as he had called her an old hag after the interviews the night before. He therefore did not seem surprised when Michelle did not come to see him into his tube. However, she came to see Devon, and she wasted no time in wishing her luck and reminding her to use any resources that she could find. The tributes then entered their tubes, and they rose into the arena. The 88th Games took place in Rocky Forests. The central cornucopia meadow lay at the lowest point of this arena, with the ground gradually sloping upwards in all directions until it reached the perimeter. Immediately surrounding the cornucopia was a small yet dense and dark forest with thick bushy trees that could easily lead a tribute to become disorientated until they reached the other side. On the outer side of the forest, the ground began to slope upwards, and as one continued towards the perimeter, one would encounter plenty of rocky hills and cliffs, with plenty of caves, small forests, and even lakes. Towards the edges of the arena, the terrain became more sparse, and the ground's level increased at an even higher gradient, until large mountains loomed over the edges of the arena and marked the perimeters. The tribute's podiums were placed around the edge of one of the meadow's sides, not very far from the surrounding forest that lay behind them. Within the grass of this meadow were a few rocks that stumped outwards from the ground and could potentially cause tributes to trip if they were not careful. This year, the cornucopia was a grand structure made entirely of rock, and once tributes started to near it, they would begin to find loaves of bread and bottles of water. After continuing slightly further inwards, they would also find a range of tarpaulins, sleeping bags, ropes and climbing claws, the latter of which even Ennius Dalton mistook for a weapon upon first glance. Once tributes entered the cornucopia, which faced towards the side of the meadow that contained the tributes' podiums, they would in fact find only twelve long spears that were hanged along the side walls of the structure, with no other weapons present. When the podiums rose into the arena, the first tribute whose face was shown on Capital TV was that of Rhea from 4. She was stood on a far left podium, with Ursula from 3 on her left, and Limerick from 4 on her right. As she appeared to let her eyes become accustomed to the glare of the sun above, she looked over to Limerick, and they immediately looked back in opposing directions, clearly annoyed at the mere sight of each other. Game Maker Fling wished that the odds be in the tribute's favour before beginning the countdown from 20 seconds. With less than 10 seconds remaining, it became clear that Rhea was planning on fleeing from the cornucopia and into the forest that lay behind her, whilst Limerick seemed intent on heading inwards as quickly as he could although he appeared to be rather hesitant at the sight of Ravello from one, who was positioned on his other side, and giving Limerick a rather threatening look. The gong sounded, and as expected, Rhea ran straight into the forest, along with Anteno from 3, Utah from 6, and Life from 12, who were positioned equidistantly around the edge of the meadow, and therefore they made no contact with each other as they fled. Meanwhile, Limerick sprinted to the cornucopia, just like most of the other tributes, as he ran, he glanced to Ravello on his right, with a slightly worried expression as the boys started to near each other. Yet as Limerick continued sprinting, he noticed from the corner of his eye that the boy from Seven, who had been placed a few podiums over to his right, had just tripped over a rock. As Limerick continued, he also noticed that Ravello stopped running in the same direction, and instead ran towards the boy from Seven, who was now trying to get up from the ground. Limerick's height helped him to travel faster towards the cornucopia than most other tributes, and as he ran past the supplies of food, water, and other survival equipment, Ravello earned the first kill of this year's games by smashing the head of the boy from Seven several times against the rock that he had tripped over, before continuing to run back towards other tributes who were now grabbing supplies. As Ravello ran onwards, Limerick and Tiberius from Two reached the cornucopia and each grab a spear from opposite walls of the structure before immediately turning around and facing each other. For a split second, it appeared like they were about to fight each other, but as the boy from Eleven hurtled his way towards the cornucopia, Tiberius' attention was diverted, and he threw the spear at the boy from Eleven's heart. Limerick used the opportunity to escape from the mouth of the cornucopia, but just as he started running, he was confronted by Barzona from Ten, who was running towards him with a climbing claw. When Barzona had entered the arena, he was placed on a central podium between Alba from 2 and Palmer from 7. When the countdown began, he appeared to be focusing on the climbing claws that were placed towards the cornucopia, 
and like a few other tributes, he appeared to believe that they were some form of weapon. When the gong sounded, Barzona immediately ran towards the nearest climbing claw. He seemed slightly distracted by the boy from Seven falling over to his left, but he continued running until he reached the claw. Whilst he grabbed it, he noticed Alba about to run to his left, and he quickly turned towards her, before smashing the claw into her right leg as she ran past, which caused her to shriek in pain and fall to the ground, triggering quite a surprise when this was reviewed during the post-bloodbath analysis. Both Barzona and Alba seemed rather surprised at what Barzona had just managed to do, but he quickly pulled the claw out of Alba's leg and carried on running to the cornucopia, just as Ravello swooped in and punched Alba hard enough to knock her into unconsciousness. As Barzona carried on sprinting to the cornucopia, he smacked the claw against the head of the girl from Five, while she was trying to pick up a tarpaulin. She shrieked and he kept running, but just as he was heading for a spear, he slowed down when he saw Limerick emerging from the cornucopia with his own spear. Both Limerick and Barzona seemed to be caught off guard by their sudden proximity to each other, but whilst Barzona held back the claw, ready to throw, Limerick threw the spear at Barzona's chest, piercing his left lung. Barzona yelled and collapsed backwards onto his knees as blood spurted from his chest, and Limerick quickly ran over and grabbed the spear from Barzona's body. Limerick then looked back at the cornucopia to see that Ravello and Velour, both from one, were now stood in the mouth of the cornucopia, collecting and apparently about to throw as many spears as they could at their nearest opponents, many of whom were still fighting for supplies without realising the danger that stood so closely to them. As the girl from one was impaled just metres from Limerick, he quickly sprinted away, zigzagging his direction from the cornucopia as he did so. He almost tripped over a loaf of bread, and looking back to see that Ravalor and Ravello were now preoccupied with the girl from Five, he quickly picked up this loaf, as well as a rope that had been dropped near the entrance of the forest before entering through the trees. As for Devon from Ten, she had been positioned on the extreme right podium next to Branson from Nine. Whilst looking at the supplies that lay in front of her, Devon seemed to notice that Branson was staring at her and appearing to try and make eye contact as the countdown began to descend from Twenty. However, she ignored him, and looked straight ahead until the gong sounded. Branson ran inwards, but Devon remained still on her podium. During the post-bloodbath analysis, it could not be agreed as to why she had not moved, but it is suspected that Branson's stares had phased her to some degree. However, after a few seconds, Devon appeared to come to her senses, and began to sprint towards the cornucopia. Yet when she looked to her left to see the boy from Seven having his skull smashed against a rock by Ravello, and then straight ahead, to see Velour bashing Branson's head with a climbing claw, she once again froze. Upon a closer inspection, Devon's heart rate and breathing spiked higher than that of any other tribute this year. But after a few seconds, she ran forward and grabbed a tarpaulin, whilst narrowly avoiding the first spear that was thrown by Velour from the inside of the cornucopia. This once again scared Devon, and she ran back in the direction of the forest, quickly grabbing some water and beginning to cry as she fled. Meanwhile, Rhea had soon become lost and disorientated within the darkness that was created by the thick trees of the forest. Yet when she heard the scream of the girl from Nine, who was killed by Tiberius not far from where Rhea was hiding, she quickly fled, almost colliding with several trees in the process, until she finally made it to the green grass beyond the forest. Rhea stood in amazement for a few seconds as she looked up to the large mountains that formed the perimeter, before running up the hill that lay ahead. Over the next few hours, she continued travelling until she seemed certain that she was safe from other tributes, at which point she rested in a small crevice between two large rocks. As Rhea rested, she began to cry and beg for some water from sponsors, as she was now thirsty, but neither she nor any other tributes could know at that time that in an amusing twist, Game Maker Fling had banned all sponsor gifts during the first day, and any forms of food or drink throughout the entirety of this year's games which meant that even if a sponsor had wanted to gift Rhea with water, they would not be able to. When she began to realise that no water was coming, she heard nine cannons sound in succession, and she once again held her head in her hands and sobbed. Limerick, on the other hand, had rested slightly longer in the forest. He crouched down behind a large tree that was next to a slightly wider path, and he appeared to be trying to ambush any other tributes that might head in his direction. But when most of the hour had passed, Without him seeing or hearing any other tributes, he began to head through the forest and to the other side. At first, Limerick seemed to become extremely disorientated, and at one point, 
He was even about to walk back into the cornucopia field, where Valor and Ravello were collecting supplies, yet eventually he realised the mistake he was about to make, and so he began to mark the trees with his spear, using the letter R in order to guide himself forwards, although it is unknown why he had used this letter. He finally made it to the other side of the forest, just as the nine cannons sounded, and the hovercraft began to collect the bodies. Whilst Rhea and Limerick had been separately negotiating the forest, Devon at first travelled rather quickly between the trees, but when she entered a darker sector of the woods, she accidentally ran headfirst into a tree and knocked herself unconscious. She lay by this tree for the next 20 minutes, with Eugenia reiterating that Devon was still alive, even though she was hardly moving. Yet when the girl from Six, who had also become lost within the forest, unknowingly ran past, Devon was awoken by this sound, and she quickly got to her feet, even though she still seemed dazed from her earlier collision. However, after a minute, screams were heard from the girl from Six, when she inadvertently ran straight into the spear of Tiberius. The close distance of this noise made Devon run in the opposite direction, which eventually led to her escaping from the forest and into the grassy rocks beyond. After a few minutes of running, Devon heard the nine cannons, but this did not stop her from travelling onwards, and after almost another hour of walking up the hills, she rested on top of a large set of rocks and admired the view. It was then that she appeared to realise that she could see lots of the surrounding arena from this point, and so she rested in this location and drank some of her water. As for Rhea, she seemed to give up on receiving any water after another hour, and so she also continued walking up the hill to the edge of the arena. As it began to get dark in the early evening, she found a small rocky cave, where she rested and curled herself into a ball, likely due to the cold temperatures in these caves, although the temperatures throughout the rest of the arena were in fact relatively moderate. Rhea seemed to be so cold that she even started to fall asleep, and after a while, no more noise could be heard from her, even though Ennius confirmed that she was still alive. Although Mayor Carter of District 4 had managed to line up some sponsors for Rhea, they were still unable to send in any gifts to her before midnight. Two cannons sounded in the later evening, which were shown to viewers to belong to the tributes from District 8, after Tiberius had cornered them within a cave on the opposite side of the arena, before quickly dispatching of them with his spear. Rhea awoke when she heard these cannons, and it then became clear to viewers that she was suffering symptoms of an illness formerly known as the Common Cold. Limerick had spent the afternoon and early evening travelling to the edge of the arena, before heading in an anti-clockwise direction, seemingly in search of something. It was discussed by Eugenia and Ennius about what Limerick might be searching for, but when he came across a lake and appeared to notice the fish swimming within, he let out a small shriek of delight, before quickly covering his mouth and looking around. At that point, Eugenia asked why they had not realised that this was what Limerick had been hunting for. He ripped off a strand of the rope and attached it to the spear, before tying the rope around a bit of bread and dangling it over the lake, and within a few minutes, he had managed to catch a fish, which he quickly gutted. As he started a fire by using some of the sticks in the nearby forest, he heard the two cannons of the tributes from District 8, but he proceeded to cook and eat this fish without paying much attention to the position of the hovercraft. Meanwhile, Devon spent the afternoon looking out from her vantage point on top of the rocks, but once the sun began to set, she used her tarpaulin in order to make a shelter within a nearby forest, from which she continued to look outwards. As the cannons of the District 8 tributes were heard, Devon seemed annoyed by the distractions, and she carefully tried to select some berries from nearby bushes in order to eat, but due to the darkness that was quickly settling in, she was unable to tell which berries were safe to eat, and she therefore only risked eating a few berries before heading back to her shelter. By midnight, most tributes were asleep, although Limerick was one of the few that were still awake. He looked at the sky as the portraits of Alba from Two, the girl from Five, the girl from Six, the boy from Seven, both tributes from Eight, Branson and the girl from Nine, Barzona from Ten, and both tributes from Eleven were all shown, which left a total of just 13 tributes remaining. Shortly after sunrise the next morning, any tributes who were still sleeping were suddenly awoken by the cannon of Motoro from Five, when he was found, chased and cornered by Ravello and Valor, who quickly killed him before carrying on hunting. Devon had spent the night in the small forest near her vantage point, and she proceeded to spend the morning looking out from the forest for any other tributes. As for Limerick, he spent the morning fishing and cooking his catch over another fire, which he proceeded to eat. 
After examining the source of the lake, he was pleased to find a stream of fresh water that flowed directly into this lake, which he used in order to collect drinking water. Aeneas stated that Limerick had in fact found a very decent place to stay through the games and wait for his opponents to kill each other off, but in the late morning, he gathered his supplies and some cooked fish before walking anti-clockwise towards the centre of the arena. As he marched, he ate the fish and held his spear at the ready, presumably in an effort to explore and find any other tributes. Around midday, Limerick rested on a hill that gave him a decent view of the cornucopia. He was also unknowingly positioned just a little downhill from Valorum Ravello, whilst a little uphill from the forest in which Devon was resting. In fact, if she had ventured slightly further towards the edge of this forest and looked up the hill to her right, she would have had a clear view of Limerick. Meanwhile, Rhea had awoken at the sound of Motoro's cannon, and she remained in her cave, where she continued to sneeze and cough through the morning with her illness. She once again begged for sponsors to send her some food and drink, but still, nothing arrived. Therefore, in the early afternoon, she walked out into the open and searched for any kind of berries in the bushes near to the clearing in which her cave was located. But being no expert on herbal toxicology, Rhea quickly consumed some unripe berries that appeared to upset her stomach, and she looked extremely sickly, with Eugenia stating that it's amazing what a difference a bit of foundation can make, which caused Ennius to snigger. Rhea soon gave up her search for ripened berries, but just as she began to stumble out of the forest and back to the cave, the ground beneath her began to rumble. Rhea screamed and fell to the ground, cowering beneath the bushes, whilst bits of the rocks in the clearing ahead of her began to fall from above and smash to the ground. Unbeknownst to Rhea, this was happening all throughout the arena, and she continued to shout for her father's help whilst crawling underneath the bush. Although some branches fell from the tree above, the bushes under which Rhea lay actually managed to provide a decent form of shelter, and she remained uninjured throughout the minute of tremors that followed. Yet as for Limerick, he soon lost his footing when the ground started shaking, and he tumbled down the side of the hill until he painfully landed against a large rock in the clearing below. Furthermore, Valorum Ravello reached the top of this hill just as Limerick landed at the bottom of the hill, and Valor gleefully shouted at Ravello that they needed to catch him. Meanwhile, Devon had very narrowly avoided being hit by a falling tree when the tremors started, and after yelping in anguish, she sprinted out of the forest and towards the nearest clearing that lay between two large walls of rocks. As the ground continued shaking, a cannon sounded, which was revealed to belong to Jesus from Twelve, when he was hit by a rock that had fallen from one of the larger mountains. Devon once again collapsed and gripped against the ground in the middle of the rock walls, whilst watching in fright as rocks smashed against the ground either side of her. When Jesus' cannon sounded, Limerick quickly got back up and watched in horror as Valor and Ravello ran down the hill towards him, screaming in joy and brandishing their spears as they did so. He sprinted over the shaking ground towards the clearing that lay between the two large walls of rocks, and as he looked around to see that Ravello and Valor were catching up on him, he quickly ran around the corner to see that Devon was lying on the ground and desperately trying to keep herself from rolling too closely to the rocks that were falling either side of her. Yet as Limerick glared at Devon in panic, the tremors suddenly stopped. Devon looked up as the tremors ended, initially in relief, but as she saw Limerick running towards her with a spear, she let out a muffled shriek and stumbled to her feet before holding her hands up and pleading in a panic as Limerick neared her. Viewers in Snow Square cheered with anticipation to see yet another kill, but to the surprise of many, Limerick began to lower his spear as he sprinted towards Devon. Limerick grabbed her by the arm and hoisted her to her feet as she asked him what he was doing, but he quickly told her to be quiet, which she did. The pair then ran, and Limerick practically dragged Devon into the next clearing. Limerick looked around in a panic as he began to hear the footsteps of Valor and Ravello approach, but Devon spotted a narrow entrance to a small cave that lay beneath two rocks, and she quickly tapped Limerick on the shoulder in order to alert him. Limerick then pushed Devon through this narrow cave entrance, and as she shouted in pain at having her elbow hit a rock, Limerick covered her mouth with his hand before forcing himself into this cave with Devon, just as they heard Valor shouting that she knew Limerick was around here somewhere. Tears began to fall from Devon's eyes, and Limerick quietly held his finger to his lips with a forceful expression. Viewers in Snow Square watched in suspenseful anticipation as the tributes from District 1 carefully examined the clearing between the two rock walls, with Valor repeating many times that Limerick may as well come out now. After a few minutes, 
they continued to walk into the next clearing, before looking for Limerick within the crevices that lay between the rocks. However, shortly before Ravello was about to discover the cave beneath the ground where Limerick and Devon were hiding, the law stated that the four must have carried on to the higher ground, and that they should go after him before they lost him. The pair then proceeded to run onwards with the spears at the ready, and it was not until five minutes later when Limerick and Devon left the cave. As they briskly walked back the way they had come, Devon asked Limerick what had just happened, to which he replied that he had saved her life, but she fired back that she would have been fine if he had not entered the clearing. But Limerick interrupted Devon, shouting that he could have just run past her and left her to be killed, but that he had chosen to save her. When Devon asked Limerick why he had made this choice, he told her that if the careers had tried to kill Devon, she would have told them which way he had gone, and after a few seconds of thought, Devon admitted that this was probably true. However, as they continued walking, Limerick said that Valor and Ravello might head back at any moment, and Devon asked where Limerick was going to take her. Limerick laughed and said that he did not plan on taking her anywhere, and that he had only spared her life as a courtesy for her finding the cave in which they had hidden. Devon then pleaded with Limerick to extend the courtesy for one night, and let her stay with him, before leaving in the morning. As Limerick appeared to be making up his mind, Devon turned out her pockets, and showed that she had no weapons. Limerick then somewhat begrudgingly agreed that Devon did stay with him for that night, as long as she watched over them for most of the night, and she would not be allowed his spear. Devon willingly accepted, and over the next two hours, they walked in almost complete silence back to the base at the bottom of the mountain, where Limerick had spent the previous night. Once they arrived at the base, darkness had set in, and Limerick quickly lit a fire. Devon asked if it was safe to do so when other tributes could be watching in the distance, but Limerick said that there were enough rocks and trees in the way to stop the fire from being seen, although Devon continued to worry. Limerick then told her that she could leave if she was not happy, but she quickly responded that she would stay, and he told her to grab some water in the now empty bottle that she had taken from the cornucopia. When Devon returned with this water, Limerick had already started fishing within the lake, and Devon immediately protested to this, stating that Limerick was a murderer to which he grinned and told Evan that she was in a place where that word was more of a compliment than an insult. Seconds later, Limerick caught a fish, and as he reeled it in on his makeshift hook, Devon stormed off into the nearby forest, quickly returning to light one of the branches under the fire, so that she could see as she walked into this forest. She then breathed slowly, and seemed to be calming herself down. After inspecting some of the berries and sniffing them closely, Devon eventually found a bush that she deemed to contain edible berries, and she joyfully picked a large selection, before filling them into the pockets of her jacket and returning to where Limerick was resting. When she returned, Limerick had just finished cooking the fish and he looked ready to eat. Devon reluctantly approached the fire, and Limerick gestured to the fish, before asking if she wanted some. Devon appeared to be about to say something rude towards Limerick, but she held her tongue and responded that she would stick with the berries from her pocket, before pulling them out and showing them to Limerick. The pair spent the next few minutes eating their respective meals in almost complete silence until Devon, who had been looking pensively at Limerick, asked him how he could live with himself after killing so many defenceless animals. He rolled his eyes, but told Devon that in his district, fishing was the only way to earn money. Devon continued to stare at Limerick without saying a word, and he proceeded to state that in this arena as well, the fish were his only way to eat. Devon looked like she was about to reply, but Limerick asked her why she cared what he did with fish, when the people of her district spent most of their time butchering cows. Devon shook her head, and said that she spent her life helping the cows to give birth. Limerick appeared surprised by this, and as Devon continued that she wanted to give her calves happy lives before they might be killed, she burst into tears, and held her head in her hands. Limerick looked at Devon like he had never seen someone crying, and he shuffled along the ground towards her, before awkwardly patting her head. She then asked why people feel the need to kill, and Limerick nodded in a consoling manner, before rather randomly asking if he could try one of Devon's berries. She seemed confused by this request, but as Limerick proceeded to eat a berry, the unflattering face that he made shortly after swallowing made Devon laugh slightly through her tears. She then said to Limerick that he should sleep, and that she would keep watch. Limerick nodded, and although he did not give Devon his spear, he told her that he would sleep right next to the fire, and that if anything happened in the night, she should not hesitate to wake him. Devon thanked Limerick, and he went to sleep, with her keeping watch. During the early afternoon, Rhea had remained in the same forest where she had sheltered during the earthquake. As it became dark, 
she eventually left the forest and returned to the cave in which she had slept the night before. Rhea still appeared ill, but shortly after entering the cave, she was finally gifted with some medicine for her condition, and within an hour of ingesting the green liquid that she was given, her symptoms seemed to improve, and although she was still famished and thirsty, she was able to sleep in the cave once again. At midnight, only the portraits of Motoro from Five and Jesus from Twelve were shown, which left eleven tributes remaining. In the early hours of the next morning, Devon awakened Limerick, and as he had previously agreed, he kept watch over her as she slept for the rest of the morning. Limerick and Palmer from Seven were the only tributes who were now awake, which led to not a lot of action occurring until the sun rose a few hours later. Limerick awakened Devon, and she walked into the nearby forest to grab more berries. As she came back, she said she would finish eating these berries and then be on her way. Limerick asked where she was thinking of heading, but she gave him a rather serious look, before telling Limerick that if she told him, she would have to kill him. Limerick laughed, and whilst picking up his spear, he told Tevin that he would like to see her try. She then looked him up and down as she picked the twigs out of her hair, before saying, calm down big boy, and turning around to pick up her water bottle. Neither tribute could see that the other was grinning after this exchange, and within a minute, Devon was ready to leave. Limerick wished her luck, and she wished him the same. He nodded, and Devon walked along the nearest path and around the corner. Limerick watched Devon as she walked out of his sight, and he headed towards the stream behind him. He proceeded to drink and run some water through his hair, that had since become rather dirty. But just as he was about to head back to the lake, he heard a piercing scream for the direction in which Devon had travelled. Limerick held his spear out and sprinted towards the area where he could hear Devon screaming for him to help her. Her screams became louder and more anguished as he neared her, until he finally ran around the corner to see that Utah from Six was pinning Devon down against the ground and strangling her. Eugenia had been beside herself with excitement when she noticed that Devon was walking straight towards a clearing where Utah had camouflaged himself into a rock. Once Devon arrived in this clearing, she stopped and looked around, probably in order to decide which direction to head, but she had happened to stop just in front of where Utah was lying. Apparently not believing his luck, Utah jumped forward and pounced on Devon, who screamed in shock and pain once he started pinning her to the ground. Limerick sprinted towards Utah, who only noticed him and his spear at the last minute, and he quickly tried to get up and sprint away, but it was too late, and in little to no time, Limerick had impaled Utah through the back. Utah fell back down and coughed violently as blood spurted from his back and chest, onto Devon, who was now screaming in disgust and rolling away. Limerick watched as Utah tried to crawl, but he instantly speared him through the back of the head, which sounded a cannon. As a drop of blood fell from the spear and onto Devon's stomach, she nervously eyed Limerick and scarpered to her feet. She thanked Limerick and began to run, apparently not even caring about the water bottle that she had just dropped. But after just a few seconds, Limerick lowered a spear and told Devon, stay with me. After hearing this, Devon stopped running and turned around to face Limerick. She asked him to repeat what he had just said, and he repeated that he wanted her to stay with him. As the hovercraft began to near them, Limerick said that they could take turns to keep him watch. Devon could have her berries and he could have his fish. Devon looked perplexed and unsure, but as the hovercraft stopped above, Limerick said that he needed to leave now, with or without Devon, before the others would come to see what had happened, whilst gesturing to the hovercraft above, that was now lowering its death claw. Devon looked behind her, and then back to Limerick, who held out his hand to her. Finally, as Utah's body was being collected, Devon ran forward to Limerick, before picking up her water bottle and running back through the forest with him. She thanked Limerick as they ran, and he told her not to let him down. Once they were back at the base by the lake, Limerick said that they needed to hide in the bushes behind the lake, in case another tribute came to follow the hovercraft. But unbeknownst to them, no other tributes were trying to approach this area. For the rest of the morning and early afternoon, the pair spent most of the time keeping watch for other tributes. Occasionally, they asked each other about their lives back home, with Limerick revealing that his name had been in the Reaping Bowl 140 times that year, whilst Devon mentioned that she had never collected tesserae, but that her parents had died during the reclamation, and that she could not really remember them due to her age at the time. Shortly after midday, Limerick became hungry, and he set up his rod in order to catch more fish in the lake. Devon quickly excused herself and ventured into the nearby bushes for some more berries, but she was annoyed and even quite distressed to see that she could not find any. 
Limerick heard a sounds of frustration, and whilst his fish was cooking over a fire, he offered to help Devon look for edible berries. She thanked him for his offer, but stated that if she could not find any, then surely he would not either. Limerick therefore returned to the fire and started eating the fish, and Devon apologised to Limerick if she had sounded rude, but before he had even had the chance to respond, she loudly asked for sponsors to send her food. Limerick immediately bolted upright and whispered at Devon to stay quiet. She fired back that this was easy for him to say, as he already had something to eat. The minutes went by, and nothing arrived for Devon to eat, and she started to become annoyed, bashing one of the trees in frustration. Limerick offered Devon some fish, and she looked back at him with an even more irked expression, before stating that she would look for berries in the further bushes. Limerick asked her in a slightly mocking manner about how her last journey beyond had gone, and she shouted something back at Limerick that had to be censored in later broadcasts. Eugenia, who was watching the scene at the time, commented to Eunice that she loved it when they argued like this. But just as Devon continued walking out of Limerick's sight, a cannon sounded, which was shown to viewers to belong to life from Twelve, when she was found by Valor and Ravello. Limerick immediately dropped the fish from his hands and ran towards where Devon had headed, but she quickly sprinted back towards Limerick as well, and they appeared relieved to realise that they were both unharmed. Limerick held Devon by the arms and said that she had scared him, to which she replied that Limerick had scared her too. She then apologised for her earlier outburst, and after screwing up her face, told Limerick that she was now starving, and that she would try some fish. Limerick looked rather taken aback, and there were even some gasps of surprise on Snow Square when Devon was heard to say this, but Limerick said that he would catch her a fish in due course, and they sat down together by the fire. Limerick proceeded to catch a fish, and he cut it up for Devon. She stated that she was only eating it as she did not want to starve, before wincing as she ate a piece. She seemed like she was about to vomit, but had one more piece, before saying that she had eaten enough for now. Limerick appeared to be trying not to show his amusement over Devon's discomfort, but as she finished the second piece and pulled a very sour face, Limerick spluttered with laughter, and Devon put her middle finger up in his direction. Meanwhile, Rhea only awakened at midday after she heard Life's cannon. Although she was no longer sneezing or ill in this manner, she had not drunk water or eaten anything substantial in approximately 48 hours. She therefore stumbled as she exited the cave, and it became clear that she was suffering from malnourishment and thirst. She coughed profusely and almost fell over once more, before shouting at her father to give her some water. However, little did Rhea appear to realise that Falor and Ravello were nearby, and they heard her shouting, arriving at her position within a minute. Ravello readied his spear as he entered the clearing, but Falor quickly stopped him by saying that Rhea might know where Limerick was. As the pair approached Rhea, she casually asked if they had any water, with Enya stating that anyone would think she was on holiday and asking from an Avox. Valor shared a bemused look with Ravello, but responded to Rhea that she could have some water if she took them to Limerick. Rhea grinned in a way that made her look inebriated, and she agreed. She initially led Valor and Ravello towards the centre of the arena, but when they were about to enter the forest, Valor asked if she was certain that Limerick was in the area, to which Rhea shook her head and asked for some water. Ravello then pinned Rhea against the nearest tree and said that she had one more chance to lead them to Limerick. Rhea now seemed rather worried, and she led Valor and Ravello around the edge of the forest. They followed her, and Valor mouthed to Ravello that Rhea seemed drunk, but he shook his head and mouthed back that she couldn't be. Yet it was at that moment that Rhea snatched Valor's water bottle from her hand before darting off into the forest. The pair immediately chased after Rhea, who was running surprisingly quickly through the forest while swigging as much water from the bottle as she could. Ravello quickly collided with the tree, and after noticing that his tooth had been chipped, he shouted at Valor to find Rhea. During this chase, even Enya submitted that Rhea was maybe not as weak as he had initially thought. Rhea continued to run, but Valor was quick to follow her footsteps, and within a minute, she managed to tackle Rhea, before pinning her head against the tree and then impaling her head with a spear. As Ravello finally caught up, Rhea's cannon sounded, and they walked back out of the forest. As Limerick took the first watch over Devon that night, he saw the portraits of Rhea from 4, Utah from 6, and Life from 12 shown in the sky at midnight, which left just Ravello and Valor, both from 1, Tiberius from 2, Anteno and Ursula, both from 3, Limerick from 4, Palma from 7, and Devon from 10 remaining. Limerick said the word sorry before looking back at Devon, who appeared to be stirring in her sleep. The next morning, 
Limerick told Devon about the fallen tributes whose portraits he had seen during the night. He then said that there were only six other tributes, and the pair spent a while trying to hypothesise where their opponents could be, yet when these guesses were analysed later, they were all incorrect. Limerick stated that he was hungry, and that he wanted to catch some more fish, but Devon stated that she was going to explore and look for some berries. Limerick appeared worried, and asked why Devon needed berries when there was fish right in front of them. Devon shot Limerick an ironic look, but he asked if she would wait until he had finished eating so that he could go with her. Devon agreed, but added that berries could be used for more than just food. Once Limerick had finished eating, he readied his spear, and Devon packed up the supplies. They began to explore the nearby forest, and after just a few minutes, Devon found some edible yellow berries. She said to Limerick that he should try one, and as he was about to put one of the berries in his mouth, Devon stated that this berry could have been poisonous before winking at him. Limerick then stated that it would take more than a berry to kill him off, and Devon simply laughed, before shaking her head and collecting more of these berries. They spent the rest of the morning quietly roaming through the forests, and Devon instructed Limerick which bushes contained berries that were either edible or contained healing qualities, before asking him to collect as many berries as possible in different pockets. Yet around midday, when they had collected decent quantities of eleven different kinds of berries, rain began to fall from above and Limerick suddenly winced as a raindrop hit his head. Devon seemed concerned, and Limerick looked confused, but when another drop of rain hit Limerick on the hand and he yelped, Devon shouted that it was acid rain, and that they needed to run. This time it was Devon who led Limerick up through the forest and towards the caves at the hills above. He shouted out in pain, and although Devon was also hit by rain, she appeared to be less affected than he was. As they reached the edge of the forest, and were approximately 50 metres down the hill from a nearby cave, Devon quickly stopped Limerick, who was about to run out into the open. A little more rain hit them from above, but she quickly took out the tarpaulin that she had managed to take during the bloodbath. She placed it over Limerick's head, and told him to run. He asked Devon what she would do, and she shouted that she was used to this rain. The rainfall started to intensify, and without wasting another moment, Devon practically pushed Limerick out from the forest, and held his hand as they ran up the hill. Devon shouted in pain as she started to be hit with more force by the rain, but within a minute they had bundled into the cave. Then to Limerick's surprise, Devon immediately ordered him to take off his clothes, while she took off her own. As Devon took off her top and winced in pain at the discoloration on her left hand, she informed Limerick that there would still be acid attached to their clothing, and that they needed to take off their clothes before this acid leaked onto their skin. Once Devon had taken off all her clothing except for her orange undergarments, she quickly checked through her pockets and pulled out some green berries. Whilst Devon crushed these berries within her hands, Limerick removed all his clothing except for his blue underwear, but as he stood by the entrance of the cave, a sudden gust caused some more of the acidic rain to hit the skin of his back, and he howled out before falling forwards. Devon shouted at Limerick to place the tarpaulin over the entrance to the cave, which he quickly proceeded to do. She then ordered him to stay still, and she rubbed the pulp of these berries into his wounds. At first, Limerick let out some shudders of pain, but he soon appeared distracted by the sight of Devon's half-naked body, and the berries seemed to have the desired effect in soothing his pain. Devon then created some more of the pulp from the berries, before rubbing it on Limerick's hands, where he had also been hit by the rainfall, and when Devon asked him to do the same for her, he returned the favour. As Limerick administered the pulp of the berries, Devon explained that in the deserts of the outer reaches of her district, they were often affected by acidic rain, and that if she was travelling far, she would always take these berries with her, in case of acidic rainfall. The pair rested in the cave as the rainfall continued. Most tributes had managed to find shelter relatively quickly after it began, which led them to escape with relatively minor injuries. However, Palmer from Seven was caught out in the open, and the skin all over her body soon became corroded by the acid. She screamed in pain as she tried to head towards the nearest mountain, but this sight and sound was extremely unpleasant for citizens of the capital. Yet by chance, a stray rock came flying down the side of the mountain and hit Palmer on the head, immediately killing her. Shortly after the cannon sounded, the rainfall slowed down, and within a few minutes, the darkness of evening was setting in. Devon checked their clothes, and she declared that the acid had dried out from them, which meant that they were safe to wear again. The pair quickly got back into their clothes, before heading out of the cave and returning towards their base by the mountain lake. Both Limerick and Devon seemed to have trouble sleeping that evening, and Devon continued to tend to Limerick's wounds as the portrait of Palmer from Seven was shown in the sky, 
which left only seven tributes remaining. Limerick allowed Devon to sleep for a longer time that morning whilst he watched over their supplies. Around midday, Devon awoke and she picked some berries whilst Limerick cooked some more fish. But as soon as they had finished eating, Gaymaker Fling made an announcement to the remaining tributes, in which she mentioned that a feast would be held in two hours within the cornucopia, and that all tributes would be gifted with something that they most needed. After a brief discussion, Devon and Limerick agreed that they would head to the cornucopia and attempt to take their feast bags if the risk of attack was not too great. Over the next hour, the pair carefully and slowly made their way to the forest that surrounded the cornucopia. They proceeded to become slightly disorientated and lost their way within this forest, but after retracing their route several times, they eventually made it to the edge of the meadow with a view of the cornucopia. Devon quietly voiced her annoyance to Limerick that the feast table had not yet risen, but he told her to be patient and that they could look around and check the edge of the meadow as they waited, in order to try and spot other tributes. They failed to see any, even though some were positioned within the surrounding trees. However, after a few minutes of waiting, the feast table finally rose, with the five feast bags on show. Devon was about to run straight forward, but Limerick grabbed her arm and told her to wait, as they would likely make themselves a target by entering first. They then spotted Antenno from three, running across the meadow from the other side to them, but just as he was about to grab the feast bag for District 3, Ravello from 1 ran into the meadow to the left of Devon and Limerick, before hurtling a spear towards Antono, which shot through his chest, and as he fell to the floor, his cannon sounded. Devon gasped, and Limerick held her back behind the tree, as Ravello continued running towards the feast table. Yet when he was halfway towards the centre of the meadow, Tiberius from 2 appeared from the tree line on the other side of the forest, and also ran straight towards the centre of the meadow. Ravello snatched up the bag for District 1, just as Tiberius threw one of his spears, but Ravello ducked, and hence narrowly avoided the spear. When Tiberius reached the centre of the meadow, the boys proceeded to jab at each other with their spears, growling almost sadistically as they did so, whilst Devon suddenly sprinted out from behind the tree towards the feast table. Limerick tried to grab onto Devon, but she had already run too far for him to stop her. He quickly chased behind her with his spear, presumably in an effort to defend her, but she sprinted and reached the feast table in little to no time. As Devon grabbed the feast bags for districts 4 and 10, Tiberius finally managed to gain the upper hand, and he stabbed Ravello in the neck with his spear. But as the cannon sounded, and Tiberius spotted Devon from the corner of his eye, he found it difficult to remove his spear in time to throw at her. Devon subsequently sprinted back towards Limerick, and he ran back with her out of the meadow. Tiberius eventually freed his spear, and threw it at Devon, but it narrowly missed her, and she and Limerick proceeded to run into the forest. As they ran forward through the density of the trees, Limerick shouted at Devon that she was crazy for grabbing their bags, to which she smiled and replied that she knew, but that she was not going to risk eating fish again. After a few minutes of running, the pair looked back and could not see any other tributes, but they now realised that they had become slightly lost within the forest, and Limerick said that they needed to stop and find their bearings before they moved on. Devon seemed to agree, and she abruptly stopped and rested by a tree that stood next to their path. Limerick walked back onto the path, and looked around for a spot that he might remember, but at that moment, he was suddenly knocked to the ground. Devon screamed as Tiberius jumped onto Limerick, and pinned him to the ground. Unbeknownst to the pair, he had followed them from the feast, and seemed to be waiting for a time to attack. After knocking Limerick to the ground, Tiberius' spear had been thrown forward, and was now out of his reach. Devon, who had initially screamed, ripped off a tree branch and charged towards Tiberius, but just as she was about to hit him, Tiberius saw Devon coming and ducked from the branch before grabbing her by the neck and telling her, wait for your turn. He then headbutted her and she fell back to the ground. Tiberius turned back to Limerick before strangling him with his bare hands, and within 30 seconds, Limerick was clearly starting to lose consciousness. Aeneas proudly proclaimed that Tiberius now looked like the favourite for this year's victor, but just as he was sending this sentence, the camera panned back to show Tiberius' determined expression suddenly changing as a spear came out of the front of his chest, with blood spattering all over Limerick, who lay below. As gasps echoed around Snow Square, Limerick started to blink and seemed to be waking, just as Tiberius drooped forwards to show Devon standing behind him, visibly shaking and on the verge of tears, 
with Limerick's bloodied spear in her hands. Tiberius's cannon sounded, and Limerick got to his feet, whilst Devon started crying, and she said to Limerick several times that Tiberius had been trying to kill him. The tears fell down Devon's cheek, and she appeared to be justifying to Limerick why she had just killed Tiberius, but Limerick told Devon to not worry, and he grabbed her hand in the two spears and feast bags, before quickly leading her through the forest with him. Limerick proceeded to help Devon back to their base, where they opened their feast bags. Limerick was pleased to see that he had been gifted with an ointment that could be applied to the wounds that he encountered during the acidic rainfall, whilst Devon seemed slightly relieved to have received a supply of fruit, even though she was still clearly in shock after killing Tiberius. Limerick set a fire, and the pair ate in near silence. After they had finished, Limerick took Devon's hand, and told her that she should not be sad, as she had acted in self-defence, and that he was grateful to her for saving his life in the forest. However, Devon looked back at Limerick, and responded that she had only saved his life by taking another life, and she proceeded to rest her head in her hands and cry. Limerick quickly responded that Devon had not done anything wrong, and he raised her head and pulled her hands from her face, thereby making her look him in the eyes. Limerick repeated this to Devon, and her tears gradually began to cease. After almost a minute of Limerick's repetition, Devon slowly moved forward and kissed him. Limerick seemed surprised, but he kissed Devon in return, at first lightly and then passionately, with this action being clearly illuminated by the fire that burned in front of the pair. They started to kiss other parts of each other's bodies, and within a few minutes, they had become much more intimate with each other. As this scene was shown in Snow Square, cheers erupted throughout, but many parents quickly led their children away, so that they could not see what was occurring within the arena, with Eugenia even stating that this was not the coupling that she was expecting this year. Over the next few hours, the pair rested in each other's arms by the open fire, and they spoke about how their opinions about each other had changed, with Limerick admitting that he was strongly tempted to kill Devon as she slept on their first night together, to which she responded that hopefully it had been worth keeping her alive. Limerick grinned, before saying that he guessed there had been some benefits, and Devon jokingly hit him on the shoulder, but he kissed her again. By midnight, Limerick was watching over Devon as she slept, and the portraits of Ravello from one, Tiberius from two, and Antenno from three were all shown, which left just Valor from one, Ursula from three, Limerick from four, and Devon from ten remaining. Over the next day, the couple alternated between speaking about their lives before the games, drinking water, and becoming intimate with each other. Limerick even apologised to Devon for having called her a plant freak during the interviews, and she grinned, saying that maybe he was correct, but that being a plant freak had possibly saved their lives, which Limerick admitted was true. However, as the darkness of night descended and Limerick fished for his supper, he noticed that the water of the nearby lake was beginning to dry up, whilst Devon headed into the nearby bushes and reported to Limerick that the berries had become colourless. Limerick said that it seemed like the games would be ending soon, and that they should head back towards the centre of the arena, as this was where the showdowns usually occurred. As the pair packed their supplies, a cannon was heard, and it was shown to viewers that this belonged to Valor from one, when she had been ambushed and attacked with rocks by Ursula from three. Limerick and Devon therefore began their journey, and Devon led them to the forest where she had spent the first night. They rested, and Devon asked if Limerick could take the first watch, which he agreed to. At first, Devon seemed to have some trouble sleeping, but Limerick put his arm around her, whilst holding his spear at the ready, and this seemed to help her sleep. When midnight came, and the portrait of Valor from one was shown, it was clear to viewers that Limerick was surprised that it was not Ursula who had been killed. As the sun rose the next morning, Devon was keeping watch from the edge of the forest, and Limerick, who had been tossing and turning a lot in his sleep, suddenly startled himself awake, which led Devon to take his hand, in an effort to calm him down. Limerick proceeded to try and pull Devon under the covers of the tarpaulin with him, but just as she appeared to realise what Limerick was trying to do, the earth around them suddenly began to rumble once more. This time, the tremors were not as strong as they had been previously, but Limerick quickly got up, and Devon seemed worried that the surrounding trees might fall upon them, although they hardly moved. The tremors suddenly stopped, but Limerick said that they needed to get out of here, and mere seconds later, a loud clattering was heard from the mountainous edges of the arena. As Limerick grabbed his spear, Devon ran out from the forest with her spear to see large pieces of rock breaking off from the heights of the mountains, which were now hurtling down the outer sides of the arena. She shouted at Limerick that there were rockfalls and that they needed to hurry. Limerick ran out of the forest, 
and they proceeded to sprint down the hill towards the centre of the arena. Limerick encouraged Devon to keep going whilst they were running, and when she tripped on a rock and fell over, Limerick ran back to help her up before they carried on to the cornucopia. As they neared the forest, the boulders made their way further inwards, but the couple had no way of knowing that a large boulder had almost hit Ursula, which caused her to jump out of the way and knock herself into unconsciousness when she hit the side of a rock, which was now causing her to bleed out. The couple continued to run, but when they were within a hundred metres of the forest, the boulders began to catch up with them, and Devon shouted at Limerick when she saw one that was about to roll straight towards them. Limerick appeared unable to hear what Devon was saying, but she grabbed him by the jacket and pulled him to the ground, which caused the boulder to hurtle past the spot where Limerick had just been running. However, he wasted no time, and as more boulders appeared up the hill, Limerick grabbed Devon by the hand and pulled her back up before running into the forest. Once they had passed through the tree line, the boulders started to collide with the trees, although fortunately for the couple, the density of the forest provided a kind of barrier against the boulders, and although some trees fell, Limerick and Devon sprinted quickly enough towards the central meadow to remain unharmed. The pair quickly looked around for Ursula as they ran through the meadow towards the cornucopia, each with a spear at the ready, but just as they stopped at the centre of the meadow, Ursula's cannon finally sounded. Devon, who was now stood just metres from Limerick, slowly began to look at him. As tears formed in her eyes, Limerick appeared perplexed by the situation that had suddenly presented itself, and he seemed incapable of looking into Devon's eyes. Devon sorrowfully told Limerick that she liked their nights together by the lake, and Limerick finally looked into her eyes and he nodded in agreement. The pair reluctantly readied their spears, and Devon proceeded to jab hers at Limerick. Devon almost managed to hit Limerick's heart, but he quickly ducked. Devon then tried to hit him again, but he kicked her spear out of the way with his right leg before rotating his entire body around and slashing the spear across Devon's neck. Limerick gasped as blood began to flow from Devon's neck, and while she held the wound with her hands, she collapsed to her knees. Limerick dropped his spear to the ground and he sat down on the grass next to Devon, hardly able to look at her. He grabbed her hand and as her grip weakened, he looked to the sky above until her cannon sounded. Limerick turned back to Devon's body and he closed her eyes, as Game Maker Fling announced that Limerick Manx from District 4 was the winner of the 88th Hunger Games. The hovercraft proceeded to enter the arena from above in order to collect Limerick, but he insisted that they take Devon's body with them, even though this is usually taken later. However, not wishing to risk any incidents, the staff at the hovercraft agreed to this request, and they collected Devon's body as well. During his victor's interview, Limerick wore a specially tailored suit of dark blue linen and sapphire embellishments with his long black hair cut short in order to smarten his image. Unfortunately for Capital viewers, Limerick did not seem quite as cheerful and humorous as he did during his interview prior to the games, but he had clearly still become a Capital favourite by this point. Upon returning to District 4, Limerick's family were delighted to be able to live in the victor's village, and Limerick proceeded to become a firm friend of Finnick Jr., with their families often spending their days together in the decades that followed. Meanwhile, on a different side of the planet, Panem's forces bravely persisted with the Siege of Glasgow, eventually capturing the city and placing it under capital rule. Over the next few days, President Gaul wisely realised that he had the opportunity to create a new district from these lands. District 14 was therefore established from the various settlements within the lands of Scotland, Wales and Eyre. Although these lands were separated by water, the capital generously improved the district's aquatic fleets over this year, thereby increasing their levels of transport and trade. The conditions were made that this district would be treated with the same authority and care that all other districts received in exchange for the majority of their vegetable produce. Furthermore, like all other districts, District 14 would send one male and one female tribute to compete in the Hunger Games from each year onwards, which meant that 26 tributes would henceforth compete in the Games.